If I were to ask you tonight, what is the definition of the Spirit of Christ? The Spirit of Christ. If I add to that and say that children of God who are faithful to God always show forth the Spirit of Christ, what would you think would be that which they showed forth, that is, that which came out of their lives? This is one of those terms that are, that's a good term, yet it depends so much upon what people think about it. In other words, if they're to think correctly about it, they're going to have to understand what the objective truth of God has to say about it. When a gospel preacher or anyone who teaches the truth proclaims the Word of God boldly, forcefully, and without compromise, dealing specifically with problems that people have that are sinful. That is, they're committing sin, they're transgressing God's law, 1 John 3, 4. Then oftentimes, somebody will say, well, he doesn't have the Spirit of Christ. And that causes me to raise the question, well, what, do you, what do you think having and demonstrating the Spirit of Christ really is. When false doctrines are exposed, particular sins are dealt with and all sorts of wickedness, no matter what the wrong may be as it is contrary to God's will, then again somebody will say, well, he just doesn't manifest the Spirit of Christ. And you begin to see then what that person's definition of the Spirit of Christ is just by what they protest. Now, you can give book, chapter, and verse, so to speak, for every point that you make. But they will contend that the Spirit of Christ has been ignored. And this begins to tell me that they are actually equating the spirit of Christ with spineless, whimpering attitude that never points out sin in a person's life, that never deals with error, that really always just retreats in the face of the devil. Their idea of the spirit of Christ is that it's a docile, capitulation to the forces of evil. And though they might tolerate it if you speak in great broad generalities, when you get right down to letting the hammer hit the nail on the head, then you don't have the Spirit of Christ. So we need to review more often the bold, fearless, uncompromising way in which Jesus himself his disciples, the apostles of Christ, the early evangelists, dealt with false teachers and others who were involved in sins. And that varied. A person involved in sin who doesn't recognize they're in sin, they're sincerely in sin. They don't mean to be committing sin, but they are. They may even think they're serving God, but they're breaking God's law, and they stand against God. You deal with them maybe one way. On the other hand, those who are set in their sins, and as we might say, they bow their neck against correction. You may have to deal with them in another way. But in both cases, the truth will be preached in no uncertain terms. So we must learn to show righteous indignation. That means we're indignant toward people's unrighteousness. There's a righteous anger 
not one we get angry because somebody's opposed me, somebody's against me personally, but it's because people violate God's law. Let's take abortion. That's an obvious one for us anyway. There are others, but we'll use that one. I get righteously indignant at the thought that there are people who are so brazen and cold that they will kill an unborn baby. It's nothing but cold-blooded murder. Now, if that doesn't bother one who is a faithful child of God and all that means, if that doesn't upset them, what would? When Paul walked around Athens and saw all of that city given to idolatrous worship, his spirit was stirred in him. And it stirred him up in such a way to want to tell them their error and bring them out of it to the truth of God. And so when he found that altar to the unknown God, he said, He whom you ignorantly worship, I will declare unto you. So we need to understand when you look at Christ and we speak of the Spirit of Christ, we're talking about a state of mind, an attitude that shows up in His words and in His actions. It's not some sort of nebulous, subjective, better felt than told thing that always just smiles at things and never deals with the problem. Never. Always sidesteps it and does it in the name of, of peace and harmony. You can't find that in your Bible. Everybody thinks they can, I'd like to know where they find it. I don't think anybody was among men, not speaking of Christ now. No one was ever a greater or more faithful follower of Christ than the Apostle Paul. He it is that God chose to write that wonderful and marvelous chapter on agape love, 1 Corinthians 13. But I don't know of anybody else in the Bible as a member of the church or another apostle that ever got right in some member's face about their sins like Paul did. And spoke very plainly. Made it very clear that that's what they did. Behold, we use great plainness of speech. There's where the problem is. You are actually speaking what you're speaking in a way that the person hearing you says, he's talking about what I believe. He's talking about that belief being wrong and not in harmony with God's will. He doesn't have the Spirit of Christ. Well, that's just false. And, of course, I have to address that, and somebody holds that view that I don't have the Spirit of Christ is saying that's just false. So what kind of spirit did Jesus manifest? Well, a hypocrite, somebody who shows himself to be one thing for the person of deceiving you when in reality that's not what he is or she is as the case may be. So when you had these hypocritical Jewish leaders who were doing all they could to obstruct the work of the Lord and he heals a man on the Sabbath day, heals his arm, withered arm, and because their custom said you can't do anything like that on the Sabbath day because that's violating teaching of the law of Moses that says you don't do any work on the Sabbath day, then they could not see the wonder of the man's arm restored and rejoice with him because they bound where God hadn't bound. They made a law where God didn't make one, and they were upset over that. And that's where we find in Mark 3, 5, that it says of Jesus, he looked around about on them with anger, being grieved. Yeah, you can be grieved, and out of that grief, look about on somebody with anger. Grieved at the hardness of their hearts. Well, what does that say about critics of sound speech today? Sound speech is the Bible defines it in preaching the word, being instant in season and out of season, reproving, rebuking, and exhorting with all long suffering and doctrine. Notice how Jesus rebuked what we would call the pretentious scribes as well as the Pharisees, and he did it before. A crowd of people. Matthew 13, I'll read it and leave a little out, but most of it, verses 13 through 33, I won't read the whole thing. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. 
Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites! For ye compass land and sea to make one proselyte, and when he's made, ye make him two, four more the child of hell than yourselves. Then he says, Woe unto you blind guides. Then he calls them, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? I don't know that that would be found in a class that is saying it pretends to teach you how to win friends and influence people. But it's the truth as it was applied to the people that he addressed, and that's what they needed. They needed the truth. And there was no mildness in this. How do you say these words, whether you say them lowly or you're crying out or somewhere in between, without the point being got across rather well? Let me ask you this. Did Jesus have the Spirit of Christ? Well, if he didn't, nobody did. So how do these words assuage the feelings of the critics of sound speech, which Paul says to Timothy we ought to have? Wholesome speech. He wasn't, our Lord wasn't, trying to win a popularity contest with the world. Nor was he seeking to mollify the feelings of these, or at least those, pretentious hypocrites. He often and openly rebuked what we would call a shallow pretense, and he did it without apologizing to them. Was that the Spirit of Christ? It certainly was. Have you ever noticed how he dealt with all of those who opposed the truth? Did he display the Spirit of Christ? Certainly, because he couldn't display any other than what he did. And so it is that what it amounts to is that what we many times have called the Spirit of Christ is not the Spirit of Christ. And where the changes need to be made is in ourselves and our view of people in error, people violating God's will, people in sin. Certainly he openly displayed displeasure at what they did that was contrary to God's will. Now, we're not talking about unnecessarily being rude and hateful, showing no manners. We're talking about the truth and how it needs to be spoken and applied to the people who need it. Peter openly accused the Jews of killing the Son of God in the first recorded gospel sermon in Acts 2, verses 23 and 26. Later, he laid the same charge against them in the second sermon recorded by Luke in Acts 3, verses 13 through 15. And the scripture says in Acts 4, 13, that the leaders of the Jews saw the boldness of Peter. But I don't find any of them even saying, well, because of his boldness, his candid speech and the frankness, why well, he didn't have the Spirit of Christ. And you know one reason they didn't, if not the reason. They had heard Christ himself. And Peter was sounding just like Christ. And they noted that they had been with Jesus. Stephen, the first Christian martyr, was on trial for his life before the Jews when he accused them, saying, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart and ears, Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Acts 7, verse 51. In my lifetime, some of those who want to reject the authority of the Scriptures, some of those who want to loose where God has not loosed in His Word, have actually said, well, He could have saved His life if He hadn't spoken this way. In effect, they're saying, well, He didn't exemplify the Spirit of Christ as we define the Spirit of Christ. Now, I'm afraid that sounds just exactly like Christ, that he was walking in the footsteps of Christ when he said what he did. Well, they rose up to kill him. 
But I don't find even those people accusing him of not having the Spirit of Christ. Paul was just as forthright when he opposed Elymas, who sought to come between Paul and Barnabas as they taught Sergius Paulus the truth. Paul said to him, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right way of the Lord? Acts 13.10. Uh, who wrote 1 Corinthians 13? Same man that said that. Who was an apostle of Christ, an ambassador of the court of heaven? Who had the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Paul did. Who was speaking as the Holy Spirit gave him utterance? Did he have the Spirit of Christ? Indeed he did. I think what he said to Elymas is pretty straightforward. But who would charge the Apostle Paul with not having the Spirit of Christ? In fact, the ninth verse declares that he was filled with the Holy Ghost. Indeed, he did have the Spirit of Christ, and he manifested what he said to the fellow that needed to hear just exactly the truth that he told him. So having the Spirit of Christ leads one to rise up against all error and contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Jude wrote that saints were to do that, that it's part of being faithful. If you find yourself running from things, just stay out of trouble, don't want to stir up anything, don't want to do this, that, or the other, mainly save your own coattail, then you might remember Jude 3, how we're to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Paul had to soundly rebuke some false brethren who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us unto bondage to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Galatians 2, 4 through 5 that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Truth is important to Paul. And he knew what these Judaizing teachers were teaching was not the truth. And if they believed it, it would cause them to lose their souls. And he couldn't be quiet about it. Paul was moved then by the genuine spirit of Christ to oppose them. The psalmist declared, through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Psalm 119, verse 104. There's no way to have the love of God in you that God teaches all of us ought to have. To truly be a Christian, one who is of Christ. To truly show the spirit of Christ and not hate every false way. And want to do what one can do by example and by word of mouth, every, every other wholesome way to lead them out of the error that they are in. We must have the same attitude toward error, and that will be showing forth the Spirit of Christ. Now, I know we're told to be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, Ephesians 4.26. And it's a shame that you can read that admonition of the Spirit through the Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus and so to every Christian everywhere and think that when you read what Paul said in Galatians 2, 4 through 5 and other places we've noticed that there is a contradiction here of Scripture. No, he's saying simply you can be angry and sin not and you get it all out of your system before the sun goes down. I found out some brethren can keep it all bottled up in them for days and weeks and years, and it turns to wrath and bitterness. Now, the other thing is, what I said earlier, don't let it be a personal matter. Have righteous indignation. Be upset at people because they're violating God's law, and in so doing, they're losing their soul. We're not to carry a grudge. We're not to harbor animosity but there's still a place for righteous indignation and godly anger as I've set it out after all God is love the Bible's clear on that but how many times do you go through the Bible and it'll talk about something like the anger of the Lord was kindled or well, the wrath of God came down two different gods the modernists used to say well the God of the Old Testament is not the God of the New Testament different gods same God God still gets angry 
at people who will not receive the truth of God and who defend themselves in the error. We don't do like some and try to go ahead and say, well, since you're going to be a sinner and love it, we'll just blow your head off. No, we don't do that. But you can be upset with, upset with sin so that you'll declare the truth and use wisdom in the doing of it. I'll tell you to show you how ridiculous some of this stuff is on, well, you don't have the spirit of Christ simply because you taught the truth. When your parents were rearing you and your daddy was disciplining you, whatever form of discipline it was, it wouldn't be pleasant then I'm sure you would have helped him out if you had just turned to him after the disciplinary process and said, you don't have the Spirit of Christ toward me. You would have seen even more of the Spirit of Christ displayed when he took that rod, as the Bible says, maybe and applied a little more so. This is something that we must be so cautious about in learning how we can imbibe in the view of the world concerning something like well, the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of Christ is the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is revealed in the Word of Christ. We put that Word into practice, then we put Christ into practice. That's just the way it works. If you're not a child of God, we urge you to become one this evening. You only have now. You may never see the tomorrow sunrise. In fact, you may never get home tonight. So you need to be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, having believed in Him, confessed your faith in Him, having repented of your sins. As a child of God, if you sin, we urge you to repent, confess it, and pray God for forgiveness. This is the reason we offer this invitation, so people can respond to the truth at this time. And we encourage you to do that if you need to while we stand, while we sing.